thank you for coming uh, to the International Comparative Law Center seminar series. We're very excited today. We have Professor Kenneth Townsend from Millsap College, and uh, I'm just going to let you take it away, sir. Okay. Thanks, right, Kenneth. Uh, well, I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, thanks, John, uh, for inviting me and for uh, the rest of you all for being here um, today. Uh, before I begin, as I was telling John earlier, I feel like I need to offer a little bit of a disclaimer. I'm not an expert in international or comparative law um, by any stretch. Um, John has read some of my work, and he seemed to think that uh, the, the stuff that I'm concerned with is interesting enough uh, to qualify. So if it seems too theoretical or not international enough, I just hope that John will share with me in the morning. Um, so, uh, today's title might sound familiar, so uh, to state again, I think you all might have seen this already, the title of my paper is Norms and Narratives, Laws, Latent Supports, and the Challenge of International Governance. So the title might sound familiar, uh, with norms and narratives, I'm self-consciously gesturing towards um, or stealing the title of one of my favorite uh, law articles, law journal articles of all time, and that's Robert Cover's Nomos and Narrative from 1983, Harvard Law. That's what I thought you were referring to, yeah. Um, so are you also familiar with Cover? I could skip some of this, but I, I guess I'll proceed. Um, so in that piece, Cover addressed law's role in creating and maintaining what he called a normative universe, or Nomos. Um, and pointed to the connection between law and narrative. Um, from the opening page of the article, um, here's an excerpt. For every constitution there is an epic, for each decalogue a scripture. Once understood in the context of the narratives that give it meaning, law becomes not merely a system of rules to be observed, but a world in which we live. In this normative world, law and narrative are inseparably related. Okay, Cover goes on to emphasize that it is narrative that connects norms slash law with aspirations slash vision. In doing so, narrative links past, present, and future, thereby integrating vision with decisions and actions of the present. And here's another quick excerpt. I hope you all bear with me as I read a couple of excerpts from cover to lay the groundwork. The codes that relay our normative system to our social constructions of reality and to our visions of what the world might be are narrative. The very imposition of a normative force upon a state of affairs, real or imagined, is the act of creating narrative. To live in a legal world requires that one know not only the precepts, but also their connections to possible and plausible states of affairs. It requires that one integrate not only the is and the ought, but the is, the ought, and the what might be. Narrative so integrates these um, domains. And narrative, of course, can only develop in the context of a community. Cover is able to integrate law and vision because of the distinction that he draws between, on the one hand, law as meaning, and on the other hand, law as social control or power. And that's going to pervade much of what I say. So law as meaning on the one hand, law as social control or power on the other. Quoting from Cover, there is a radical dichotomy between the social organization of law as power and the organization of law as meaning. Law as meaning is, in Cover's terms, world creating, whereas law as social control is, in Cover's terms, world maintaining. By no means does Cover dismiss or criticize law as social control, rather he emphasizes that law does not simply maintain a community by enforcing norms, but it also creates norms and gives meaning to those norms. Given acts only make sense, they only take on meaning when done in reference to a norm. And here's my last excerpt that I'm going to use from Cover. And then, uh, then we'll be done with him for a while. Um, cover states, there is a difference between sleeping late on Sunday and refusing the sacraments, between having a snack and desecrating the fast of Yom Kippur. In each case, an act signifies something new and powerful when we understand that the act is in reference to a norm. It is this characteristic of certain law-breaking that gives rise to special claims for civil disobedience. But the capacity of law to imbue action with significance is not limited to resistance or disobedience. Law is a resource in signification that enables us to submit, rejoice, struggle, pervert, mock, disgrace, humiliate, or dignify. So for cover then, law enables a wide range of meanings and emotions to be given expression. Law restricts and maintains, but it also creates and enables. So what, you might ask, does this have to do with international law? What does this have to do with my title, Law's Latent Supports and the Challenge of International Governance? 
Uh, let me attempt a brief answer um, before proceeding. The overarching argument I offer today is this. Law is best understood as containing and covers terms world-maintaining and world-creating elements. In the contemporary West, particularly as manifested in liberal political theory, law's world-maintaining elements overshadow law's world-creating elements. Law is chiefly understood as a tool for maintaining social control, not as a source for creating meaning. A thin, procedural, world-maintaining conception of law potentially offers many virtues. It often does a better job of acknowledging pluralism and accommodating diversity. Rights, once the product of divine favor or royal caprice, find new grounding in rational principles of justice rather than through a common history or shared narratives, meaning that systemic injustice and entrenched inequality face an increasingly higher burden of proof to justify their existence. Despite as many virtues, however, this approach to law has limits, and its limits are most conspicuously displayed, at least potentially, um, in the context of international law. Law's latent supports, such as a common history or a shared vision for the future, that aid the actual practice of law in liberal state, even if contrary to what liberal theory would dictate, are not as readily available for international legal context in which no nomos unites the nations of the world either implicitly or explicitly. Law in the contemporary world has become increasingly pervasive through its regulative functions even as it has simultaneously been denuded of its normative or world-creating force. So in my comments today, I intend to both elaborate upon and problematize its received wisdom. I'll begin by, outline, by outlining two accounts of law that very clearly reflect holistic, aspirational accounts of law. Um, law is understood in ancient Israel, reveals the power of history and narrative to shape law's role in creating meaning in a community, and Reformation-era theologian John Calvin offers a conception of law that is deeply aspirational and is animated by a vision of uniting law and gospel through the Christian community. In my closing remarks, I suggest that the practice of liberalism's law might very well involve a greater reliance on what I'm terming law's latent supports than liberal theory acknowledges. In other words, I suggest that the practice of law in liberal states, particularly in the U.S., which is what I focus on, might very well reflect continuity, not discontinuity, with pre-liberal modes of political community and conceiving law. Whether we see continuity or discontinuity with these previous forms of political community will directly impact our assessment of the viability of international law. Okay. So... Should I stop periodically and ask if there are questions, or should I just proceed? No, okay. we're not shy. Okay. Um, <laughs> it is no coincidence that covers nomos and narrative uses ancient Israel as the prototypical example of the intersection and interdependence of nomos and narrative, of law and vision, of norm and history. For it was through ancient Israel's history, Israel's narrative, that its normative universe, its legal culture emerged. You can hardly imagine telling Israel's history without reference to law, and you cannot speak of its law without considering Israel's particular history, its covenantal relationship from which its law emerged. The social contract tradition within liberal political theory, the dominant mechanism for establishing accounts of justice from Hobbes to Locke, from Kant to Rawls, highlights for us the many differences between liberalism's ahistorical law and the historically dependent law of ancient Israel. While there are admittedly certain similarities between Israel's covenant with God and modern notions of the social contract, the differences between covenant and contract are more significant than the similarities. Israel's covenant was formed and developed in a pre-liberal, pre-modern world in which the unity of social, ethical, and legal worlds was assumed, where law very clearly included world-creating as well as world-maintaining elements. Because of the universal aspirations of liberal political theory, law and modern and contemporary liberal political theory is almost completely ahistorical. To make the social contract contingent upon any particular history would risk rendering the outcome of the social contract particular and not universal. Social contract theory allows only for a theoretical or caricatured past. It might be a time when life was nasty, brutish, and short, um, think of Hobbes, or a time of relative bliss, um, before the complications of human society arose, think Rousseau. Whatever the case, the past can never be the actual or even the sincerely imagined past in a mythological sense of the people for whom the contract applies. The past is self-consciously artificial and instrumentalized. Without an actual history to engage, the complexity of citizens' lives is lost. 
Questions of meaning, which are inherently controversial, are relegated to the private, non-legal realm. Israel's covenant with God could hardly be more different. The covenant emerges directly from Israel's history. The introduction and explication of the Ten Commandments, for example, are scattered with references to the particular history between God and Israel. Consider this from Deuteronomy. Moses convened all of Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and ordinances that I am addressing to you today. You shall learn them and observe them diligently. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Oro. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and the house of slavery. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. This passage shows that Israelites' duties to God and to one another were rooted in a covenant of remembrance, remembrance of their particular shared history. In addition to being a historical, the law of liberal theory um, also prioritizes the general over the particular in seeking universal principles of justice, the, particular, the particularity of citizens' lives, the stuff of narrative is also lost. In modern social contract theory, a given person or people stand in for humanity generally. Those seeking to escape Hobbes' harsh state of nature, those seeking to form agreements in Locke's uncertain state of nature, or those deliberating behind John Rawls' veil of ignorance share one thing. They lack any individuating features. They could just as well be you or I, and we could just as well be they. The whole purpose of the social contract, in fact, is to devise a hypothetical arrangement to which anyone could have agreed. Taking into account particularity runs the risk of jeopardizing the universal aims of liberal justice. And this is clearly not the case with Israel's covenant with God. The particularity um, of Israel um, is hard to overstate. In fact, it's the whole point of the covenant. According to the Old Testament, God chooses Israel as a particular people, not as a random representative of humankind. Again, from Deuteronomy, God says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. It is you the Lord has chosen out of all the peoples on the earth to be his people, his tre treasured possession. All right. So, so can, you, can there be, uh, I guess the question that's obviously implied with what you're doing is whether you can have more than one narrative mm -hmm. uh, occupying mm -hmm. the, either the political mm -hmm. debate or the law itself. Yep. Um, I'm inclined to say yes. I think yeah. that ancient Israel is an example that on the one hand there's this big narrative, there's this meta, um, well, I guess to use a anachronistic term, a meta-narrative that um, shapes Israel's interactions with God. But there are all sorts of sub-narratives, I think, that are at work as well. And I think that you could say the same thing applies wherever. What I'm more concerned with is not saying there has to be a single narrative, but that there are narrative elements um, that engage questions of meaning, that take questions of meaning seriously. Um, now, one of the challenges, though, if there are lots of different narratives, and no one narrative really has precedence, maybe this goes without saying, as I get into in a moment, in particular talking about the, the power of vision, the role that vision plays in um, imbuing law with meaning, um, Sometimes vision requires something like a, a consensus or, if not unanimity, some significant agreement about what we're after. And that's one of the things that liberal theory tries to deal with. It acknowledges in many ways the fact that we have different ways of approaching things. We have different conceptions of the good, right? Prioritization of the right over the good is animated in significant part by this disbelief. Yeah, and the overlapping consensus ideas right. bring right. it back in. Yeah. And so as I say later in the paper, um, but maybe I should make clear now, I'm not saying that liberal theory is wrong necessarily. I, I think that liberal theory um, perhaps should be more attuned to um, the practice of politics and law, um, which sometimes diverge in significant ways from what liberal theory would outline. Um, and that in and of itself might not dictate anything, but um, I think it at least needs to consider that gap between theory and practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't trying to short circuit things. No, no, it's fine. Um, Feel free to jump in. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it seems to me that that's what's been absent, right? I mean, if you think of the critiques of yep. political liberalism, it's by feminists and other yep. forms of identity, right? That say, we can't. Mm -hmm. or, or people who follow mm -hmm. religious traditions, we can't give the, those things up right. to enter into right. politics. Right. So uh, they're kind of excluding what makes life meaningful right. and shapes how you think as a person. So right. you, 
Um, so I, I think that that idea is now becoming much more prominent that, that that's been missing in a right. lot of the political and legal yep. theories. Yeah, I think so. Um, right. okay. uh, sometimes wonder what cover would have done if he would have lived longer. I know it's um, a shame that he died. I think at forty-two. Yeah, uh, very untimely death. Because um, I use Walzer has a collection yep. of, of essays from the Jewish tradition by cover. He's got one by cover, one by Suzanne Stone. And, others that try and struggle with the fact that mm -hmm. Jewish law is supposed to take precedence over yeah. national law. And uh, so I, I don't know if you're gonna address that too, yeah, but I, that's also an issue, I guess, that's there. Yeah, I don't address that specifically. Um, I think that running through my comments are um, at least an implicit, if not explicit acknowledgement that there is an ongoing and inevitable tension um, between different values and different goods. Yeah. Um, and liberal theory My, has selected certain bundles of goods yeah. um, to the exclusion of others. Um, and sometimes those other bundles of goods are selected in the realm of, of practice in ways that liberal theory might not countenance fully. So um, I hope I've been at least somewhat responsive to what you Yeah, mean. no, I, I hope as, as I'm I may be pushing you so. too far ahead. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So transitioning, transitioning just slightly. Um, but sticking with ancient Israel for a little bit longer. Um, sorry, can I? Sure. No sorry, can I keep going? I'll try okay. and fix the door. Um, one of the greatest names of liberal Mark, theory. I'm sorry, can I? Mark, that door doesn't need a key to open. You can either take the key out and just shut the door or leave the key. Oh, okay, open. I'll leave it in there. Okay. Sorry. No problem. Um, so transitioning slightly, but sticking with um, Israel for just a little bit longer. Um, one of the greatest aims of liberal theory, um, related to what we were saying a moment ago, Mark, um, is to take the passion out of politics, to prioritize the right over the good, and to make law contingent upon neither a particular history um, nor a particular conception of the good. Social contract theory is grounded upon considerations of reason and interest. And here I'm channeling Khan a little bit, Mark. Is mm, my yeah, yeah, I mean, you can see his influence. Yes. Right here. Um, Reason dictates what justice requires in a universal sense, and interest points to the material nature of what justice protects. Considerations of the will or love are absent, in large part because they are viewed as too unpredictable. The objects of the will, unlike those of reason and interest, are not easily universalizable. The objects of the will, um, or in the social contract, reason provides a formula of sorts um, for producing justice. Interest is stripped of individuated ends and instead refers to what every man would presumably expect from the state, given the assumption that no personal relationship exists prior to the creation of the contract. The human will, however, is attached to and constituted by things that may or may not be explicable on grounds of reason or interest. Faith, love, and loyalty cannot be captured by the social contract model cannot be easily captured, I guess I should say, by the social contract model of political community. And it is exactly these sorts of things that figure prominently in Israel's covenant with God. Israel is obligated to God not simply because of a prior contract they signed, but because of the love and gratitude that emerged from their history together, from their covenant relationship. Jewish ethicist Louis Newman gestures towards this form of duty when he says, if we conceive the covenant, and I'm quoting here, covenant as arising out of Israel's gratitude for God's prior acts of salvation and protection, then covenant is grounded in a kind of pre-existing moral duty. The moral duty to express gratitude to one's benefactor would appear to be the basis of all legal duties arising under the covenant. End quote. This pre-existing moral duty is not easily comprehended by social contractarian accounts of political community. Liberal theory has difficulty conceiving the person as one whose ends, values, or commitments exist prior to those ends, values, or commitments being chosen by the individual. Just think Rawls. Okay, so now, I hope this works. Now I'm going to briefly sketch the outline of an argument that figures prominently in another version of this, I guess you could call it this paper, of another paper, but which can very easily get us in the weeds if we're not careful. Um, so for present purposes, I simply aim to argue that there's a particular concept in the Old Testament that reflects ancient Israel's holistic conception of law that is rooted in their particular history. Israel's covenant with God included a particular feature, hesed, if we're going to use Roman letters H-E-S-E-D, um, that has no analog in contemporary liberal theory. Hesed typically is translated as mercy, 
but is both a virtue and an obligation in the Old Testament context. It has legal foundations, but it is ultimately rooted in history and relationship. As noted in social contractarian systems, procedural justice um, governs legal behavior. Mercy, by its very nature, however, often implicates a category of exception. In a paradoxical way, mercy is neither completely consistent with nor violative of legal norms. This category of exception is difficult for contractarian justice to, apprehend, to comprehend. Principles of justice in the social contract are rationally established ex ante, and neither relationships nor non-rational forces are allowed to abrogate those principles. To do so would involve compromising justice. But clearly, the Old Testament does not appear to conceive hesed, chesed as something that compromises justice. Chesed does not compromise justice in the Old Testament because of Israel's covenantal relationship with God that makes space for such a virtue. A contractarian ethic has difficulty comprehending a value such as chesed that is simultaneously obligatory and supererogatory. Indeed, chesed is only possible because of the rich history and the strong sense of relationship that emerges from Israel's covenant with God. This covenant shapes not only how Israel deals with God, but also how they relate to one another. It is this personal covenantal ethic that allows the political community to display mercy. And I'm happy to talk more about this if this is of interest um, at the end. Um, for now, to, in some ways, I'm going to go off script just for a moment, though, and, and try to respond to some of what Mark was saying a moment ago. Mercy exists. There are displays of mercy. If we look at the American legal system, there are displays of mercy, whether it's through executive pardons, jury nullification, um, and grants of amnesty by legislatures. I'll reference this a bit more in a moment, but in some ways I want to preview it. Um, there is, at least on the face of it, some tension between a, a social contract model of law and these expressions of the exception that mercy necessarily involves. So in some ways, what I'm inclined to do is start with the, the world that's out there and make observations about that world that's out there and see where it lines up with liberal theory and see where there might seem to be some gaps. And then where there are those gaps, I think, are often interesting spaces for exploration. So, um, all right, I'm going to skip a little short paragraph I have here just summarizing Israel. I think y'all got it. Um, we're, um, so we've been looking at the power of history and narrative to imbue law with world-creating force. We now turn to focus our attention on the role of vision um, to infuse law with meaning. The covenant metaphor continued to shape Christian notions of religious and political community. Perhaps no Christian thinker is more associated with covenantal theology than John Calvin. Um, more so than other reformers, Calvin provided an especially robust and purposive account of law, of civil, theological, and educational varieties. The mul multiple purposes that Calvin outlined for law and the unity that Calvin saw between law and gospel allowed him to articulate, articulate a fuller account of justice than was outlined by other reformers and a more aspirational account than was provided by subsequent versions of liberal justice. For Calvin, cosmic and legal justice were unified and manifested in the vision of the covenantal community. The unity that Calvin perceived between law and gospel is most clearly found in his description of the three uses of law in Book Two of his Institutes. The first use of the law, according to Calvin, was the theological use, the use of the law that convicts us of our sins. The second use of the law was its civil use which aims to prevent undesirable behavior in society. The third use of the law, the so-called didactic use of law, is for our purposes the most interesting. According to Calvin, and I'm quoting here, the third use of the law, being also the principal use and more closely connected with its proper end, has respect to believers in whose hearts the Spirit of God already flourishes and reigns. It's kind of an odd phrasing, but important language here, the principal use and more closely connected with its proper end. That's the third use of law. Calvin goes on to say the third use of the law allows Christians, quote, daily to learn with greater truth and certainty what the will of the Lord is which they aspire to follow and confirm them in this knowledge, end quote. Law ought to lead to right knowledge and genuine understanding regarding the connection between what one does and what one ought to do between what one desires and what one ought to desire. In other words, Calvin's law is deeply concerned with presenting a vision of the good life for the Christian community. Now consider Luther for a contrast. 
At first blush, Lutheran, uh, the Lutheran three uses of the law closely resembles Calvin. The Lutheran's formula of concord states, and I'm quoting here, first, that thereby outward discipline might be maintained against wild, disobedient men. Secondly, that men thereby may be led to the knowledge of their sins. And third, thirdly, that after they regenerate, they might have a fixed rule according to which they might regulate and direct their whole life. End quote. Except for inverting the first and second uses of law, which as you might have noticed, Calvin started with the, the theological, um, and Luther starts with the civil. Um, Calvin's classification appears very similar to the Lutheran's formula of concord. But the different ordering, ordering is not insignificant. By beginning with the theological, or as it's sometimes called, the pedagogical use of the law, and by listing third, the guiding features of the law, the didactic function of the law, Calvin suggests that law begins and ends with understanding and not with punishment. The civil use of the law for Calvin is based on either side by pedagogical and aspirational use. Furthermore, I don't mean to get too much into arcane controversy, but there is some doubt as to whether Luther himself even accepted a third use of the law or if it was simply um, added by later followers, especially Philip Langston. While contemporary Lutherans dispute whether or not Luther accepted a third use of the law, it is undisputed that Luther held the third use of the law in lower esteem than Calvin. Again, it's this didactic function of the law that includes vision. Luther was particularly concerned with that mixing earthly and heavenly purposes, law could lead to um, legalism, thus undermining the truth of the gospel and solo fide. Now, to clarify, the didactic function is only if law is informed by scripture. Right. Because Calvin's fairly cynical about mm -hmm. Uh, whereas in Roman Catholic natural law That's tradition. Right. So I guess one of the issues is the source of law and Luther's more cynical mm -hmm. uh, or less, I guess, confident that mm -hmm. the state can actually perform this theological That's right. Yeah. And, and Luther, um, as I'll say in just a moment, in, in many ways prefigures secularism more clearly. Yeah. And Calvin, as That's I'll right. also get into in a moment, in some ways prefigures um, or Europe versus Republicanism America. of a sort. Yeah, yeah, in some ways, maybe Europe versus the U.S. But in other respects, maybe early America or something. I mean, because yeah. it, it's complicated. Yeah. Um, but Americans tend to be more Calvinistic. Yes. Than, yeah. Than Lutheran in this way. Um, so the law, according to Luther, structured a secular realm that was quite distinct from the spiritual realm. Law applied to the civil realm, gospel applied to the spiritual realm, in part because of this capacity. It's a question you've raised, Mark. As theologian Jesse Conhaven has noted, Luther's sharp distinction between law and gospel has a tendency to result in a dualism between a worldly state and a Christ-based church, as well as a split in the lives of individual believers who live in both spheres but find it hard to unite them. End quote. Furthermore, and I'm quoting Conehaven again here, since the law, as Luther usually understands it, contains nothing positive, it does not point the state towards fullness of life found in the gospel. The state has to do with justice and human reason and not revelation of perfect love. They're different realms. Calvin's vision of law, including the relationship between law and gospel, is quite distinct from that of Luther, whose ideas, as I've noted, uh, more clearly prefigured the secularism of liberalism. Uh, to be clear, it is Calvin's third use of the law that connects the theological and civil uses. It does so by helping to conform action to belief. The third aspirational use of the law, in Conhaven's words, quote, points the state towards the fullness of life found in the gospel, end quote. For Calvin and Luther, the truth of the gospel was rooted in mercy. Only Calvin, however, connected law with gospel in such a way that the truth of the gospel could infuse the life of the law. Okay. So they both believed that mercy was central, Luther and Calvin, but Luther believed that law and gospel interacted in such a way so that they could perform complementary functions. So law's diverse uses reflect a more general unity for Calvin between civil and spiritual realms, between law and gospel. While formally distinct, the two were united in their common ends. That unity was manifested for Calvin in the covenantal community of believers. By infusing the civil realm with notions of heavenly goodness, Calvin's civil realm revealed a vision of law that was both a tool for social control as well as a source of meaning. In Book 4 of the Institutes, Calvin makes clear that the civil and spiritual realms, although formally distinct, are not completely separate. 
Contrary to appearances, according to Calvin, the civil and spiritual realms are connected. More importantly, the two spheres are not simply connected, but they also serve to advance the ends of the other. In perhaps his clearest statement on the interdependent relationship, Calvin writes, quote, Civil government is distinct from the spiritual and internal kingdom of Christ, but we ought to know that, we, that they are not adverse to each other. The former, in some measure, begins the heavenly kingdom in us, even now, upon the earth, and in this moral evanescent life commences immortal and incorruptible blessedness. While the latter is a sign so long as we live among men to foster and maintain external worship of God, etc. The important part there is the former civil law in some measure begins the heavenly kingdom in us, even now upon the earth, and in this moral evanescent life commences immortal corruptible blessedness. So the civil realm does this pretty important stuff according to Calvin. Um, and adapts our conduct to human society. One can hardly imagine a clear statement that each realm works to accomplish the ends of the other. In fact, the ends, it seems, are not distinct at all. The civil and heavenly realms use different means to achieve common ends. Okay, so now we're going to transition just a bit um, to, to raise some questions about the, um, the gap between Calvin's world and our own. Okay. Calvin and Calvinism are frequently credited with shaping the development of modern legal and political systems. Here I briefly outline the argument for how Calvinism's approach to law and civil life likely offered certain advantages when compared to the early modern alternatives of Catholics, Lutherans, and Anabaptists. I then point to reasons why, irrespective of Calvin's role in shaping early modern legal and political systems, that his influence in law and civil government is limited in contemporary liberal political theory. Calvin and later Calvinists appear to have had good resources for holding in balance particular tensions between civil and spiritual realms. Calvin's theology provided a basis for valuing the civil realm of law without letting it overwhelm the heavenly realm of the gospel. In so doing, Calvinism distinguished itself from Catholic, Lutheran, and Anabaptist alternatives. Early modern Catholics did not acknowledge a separation between civil and religious society likely resulting in a slower development of an autonomous civil sphere in many Catholic countries of Europe. Lutherans, like Calvin, recognized the distinction between civil and heavenly realms, but were much less likely than Calvin to appreciate the ways in which each realm was linked to the other. As a result, the laws of the civil realm lacked the sense of vitality and sacredness that they did for Calvin. In contrast to Catholics, Lutherans, and Calvinists, Anabaptists largely advocated withdrawal from the civil realm altogether. Their imprint on the development of law and politics during the early modern period was thus mostly indirect. Some of these are very broad statements that can very easily be problematized if y'all like it. Yeah. Uh, the formal separation but ultimate unity of the civil and heavenly spheres of norm with vision allowed Calvin to be both idealistic and realistic about law's capacity. Calvin more so than any prominent theologian recognized the pervasiveness of human sinfulness. Calvin, the realist, with his emphasis on sin, chastens any legal or political system that would assume the perfectibility of humankind. Calvin, the idealist, however, reminds us the potential for law to educate Christians in God's will and to cultivate virtues of citizenship. The development of Western legal and political institutions in the modern contemporary era is very likely benefited from Calvin's recognition of the law's limits as well as its capacities. Onlookers, and I mentioned this a moment ago, have been particularly interested in tracing the connections between Calvinism and Republicanism, a connection most plausibly evidenced by observing the deep respect according to the legal and political institutions that developed through the influence of Calvinism. Our world, as I've said, though, is no longer Calvin's. Republicanism of the early modern era has given way to new varieties of democratic and liberal individualism, resulting in a civil realm that has largely been desacralized. Public institutions no longer make claims to represent or to promote spiritual ends or values. In Calvin's schematization, law structured freedom by ensuring order amidst chaos. Law restrained, but it just as importantly educated and enabled. It was only able to do so, however, by orienting freedom towards particular ends. As these ends became plural, Liberty increasingly came to be understood in negative rather than positive terms. In other words, liberty came to be understood as the absence of constraints 
rather than the capacity to connect one's empirical desires with an authentic self. Since law has now largely come to be defined in terms of limits, as a tool for social control and not as a source of meaning, and since freedom is defined by the absence of restraint, law only has the possibility of being viewed negatively. Calvin was able to articulate an aspirational account of law and a positive account of liberty because he was confident that law and spirit had the same objectives. Law was not completely separate from the gospel, but rather something that aided the gospel. In the parlance of contemporary liberal political theory, the right and the good conduced to the same end. Now the Tea Party mixes both of these, right? If it's a law of someone uh, that they disagree with, it's looked at only negatively, but then they want to regulate abortion and same-sex marriage, so yep. it, it kind of mix yeah. types, I guess. If it doesn't have the right vision in forming it, it's, exactly. it's problematic. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's interesting because what I would say about the Tea Party, but it's not limited to the Tea Party, but I think is exemplified by the Tea Party, is um, the power of narrative to and vision mm -hmm. to shape what they view as law's rightful place. Yeah. And you're exactly right that in some respects, to someone who's using the categories of liberal theory of, say, negative liberty versus positive liberty, it can come across as incoherent. Um, what do you mean? Do you want constraints or not? Right? But it's. Um, yeah, the, government, so the president's like Hitler, but then right. all of a sudden you want to regulate abortion. Right. So it's it's, it's just the wrong dictator. Right? Yeah, in some ways. I mean, maybe that's one way to put it. it, it, it Sorry. You in, invest, um, I mean, to even soften that a little, but to accept what you've noted, I, I think that, right, who is it who is, um, who embodies our meaning at the moment, right? Obama does not embody the meaning, the sense of meaning, the narrative, the shared history, the vision of the good life that the Tea Party values. Right. Um, so. Um, Let's see. Um, the early 21st century is far removed from Calvin, as we've acknowledged, both in time and in metaphysics. Uh, the modern era has wit witnessed an ironic uh, inversion of ultimacy. The common ends that once united spiritual and civil realms have been privatized as those ends have come to be seen as controversial and plural, rather than unifying and common. Acknowledging the diversity of ends resulted in increased attention to uniform rules and procedures. Since there was no longer any agreement about the teloi that mattered, the ends that mattered for society, law gradually lost its aspirational features and became simply a way to punish, um, to limit and to punish uncivil and criminal behavior. Perhaps the clearest emblem of these changed attitudes towards law can be found in the legal positivism of Oliver Wendell Holmes in his familiar description of the bad man. Quote, a bad man has as much reason as a good one for wishing to avoid, to avoid an encounter with the public force. And therefore you can see the practical importance of the distinction between morality and law. The practical importance between, distinction between morality and law. A man who cares nothing for an ethical rule which is believed and practiced by his neighbors is likely nevertheless to care a good deal um, about avoid, avoiding being pay, made to pay money and will want to keep out of jail if he can. Now, of course, not all legal, not all contemporary legal and political theorists have abandoned the possibility that law and morality could be connected. John Rawls, um, a theory of justice, for example, helped reinfuse political theory with notions that laws had moral foundations and implications. The major challenge facing such efforts, however, is that the only foundation available for morality is reason. As Calvin was aware, um, reason alone could not adequately ground civil government or at least it has challenges. Calvin, more so than contemporary liberalism, recognized that legal positivism, again, it's a bit an uh, anachronistic to say this, but recognized that legal positivism um, that only takes into account self-interest is unlikely to produce laws that inspire the respect of political communities. And Calvin knew that reason was a method that could not be untethered from substantive commitments. Okay, now I'm gonna even outline a bit more clearly the logic of the the great separation, to use the term of Mark Lilla. I'm not sure if, if y'all have read Mark Lilla, but as Lilla has noted, the unity of the pre-modern world has come to be, and I'm quoting here, replaced by a new approach to politics. All right, the unity of pre, the pre-modern world has come to be replaced by a new approach to politics focused exclusively on human nature and human needs. 
A great separation took place, severing Western political philosophy decisively from cosmology and theology. It remains the most distinctive feature of the modern West to this day. It's a pretty big claim. Lilla largely credits Hobbes for ushering in this separation that applied reason as opposed to theology to address material as opposed to spiritual concerns. Although, as we discussed, theologians like Luther likely played an important role as well in helping to create an autonomous secular public sphere that viewed Law's role in more social control ways than in source of meaning ways. One, that's, one thing is revealing about Lilla's book, his chapter on religion has no footnotes. I know. It's bizarre. Yeah. So he cites Hobbes, but he doesn't cite Calvin, Thomas. Amen. It's know, incredible. He, he doesn't understand religion. It's just I bizarre. I mean, he's a smart guy, and I enjoy reading Lilla. I like the way that he approaches things, but he doesn't understand religion. As Lilla notes, the secularization of the West led to a greater acceptance of diversity and put an end to religious warfare, at least in certain ways. The irrational exuberance created by religious devotion has given way to a calmer, more reasonable public realm. The rise of reason has helped establish the liberal values such as impersonal justice and equality before the law. And to be clear, as I said earlier, the values that Lilla celebrates are no doubt commendable, um, very commendable. Uh, they have come at a cost. Bracketing considerations of the good and excluding questions of meaning from the public realm, including law, has at times contributed to what critics of liberalism call the naked public square, or variations on that theme. As I prepare to close, let me suggest that even though Lilla is certainly right to emphasize the great separation, the separation between law and meaning in the realm of theory, it is less clear that the same separation has occurred at the level of lived experience. Liberalism represents both a break from and a successor to previous worldviews. And I've gestured towards this already, and again, I'm channeling Kant, who I self kind or I explicitly reference here at the moment. Um, all right, so just to go back over what we've done for the last few minutes, we've looked at Calvin, and now we've looked at uh, the Great Separation. We've looked at how our world is different from what Calvin uh, experienced and articulated. What I'm going to do for the next few minutes is, next couple minutes, is to try to show some points of continuity. Okay? What I'm interested in doing as I move towards the end is gesturing towards some points of continuity between what was before, whether that's Calvin's vision of law or a, a unity of law and ethics, um, towards where we are now. Um, but feel free to interrupt or interject at any moment. So even though the contemporary world is far removed from Calvin, he and other early modern reformers deeply influenced the secular world that followed. In the three uses of law, um, John Witte and Thomas Arthur, um, this is in the Journal of Law and Religion, I believe. Yeah, the Journal of Law and Religion. According to Witte and Arthur, modern secular understandings of the uses of the law, retrib retributivism, deterrence, and rehabilitation, are the heirs of 16th century doctrine regarding the three uses of the law, theological, civil, and didactic. As they explain, and I'm quoting them here, the theological doctrine of the uses of moral law and the legal doctrine of the purposes of criminal law are closely analogous not only in their formulation but also in their foundation. Like the theologians, the jurists believe that persons and societies are at once sinful and saintly. They thus tailored the criminal law as a whole to both types of persons and the criminal punishment of any individual to both dimensions of his or her character. This should sound familiar. As we discussed, for Calvin, the civil and heavenly realms were directed towards the same ends. And because of this unity, the covenantal community was able to embrace expansive conceptions of justice and aspirational accounts of law. Law was designed, as Witte and Arthur note, to coerce, discipline, and nurture. In Calvin's world, the distance between criminal and sinful activity was minimal, and likewise, as a result, justice and mercy were complementary values. Furthermore, according to Witte and Arthur, following the example of the reformers, early modern secular jurists, quote, subsumed and integrated their uses doctrine into a more general theory. And, and another quote here, the theologians subsumed their uses in a more general theory of salvation, for them, the moral law played an indispensable role in the process from predestination to justification to sanctification. The jurists subsumed their uses doctrine in a moral theory of government. For them, the criminal law played an indispensable role in discharging the divinely ordained tasks of the state to coerce, discipline, and nurture its citizens." End quote. 
Early modern reform theology and modern criminal law thus both assumed a unity between particular uses of the law and general theories of the good. Law, in other words, was an important locus of meaning that gave content to the Christian community's vision of the good life. So it doesn't take much effort, I don't think, I'd be interested to hear y'all's thoughts on this though, if you have any. It does not take much effort to make connections between what Witty and Arthur describe as the general theory of salvation and the moral theory of government. Um, liberal citizenship entails a process similar in form to salvation, I submit. Liberal virtues. Yes. So predestination represents our being born into a particular political community. Justification represents our citizens' free and equal status before the law. And sanctification represents the cultivation of virtues of citizenship. Now, contemporary liberal theory has difficulty, though, comprehending, comprehending anything but the second prong. And that is the justification, the equality before the law, etc. Accepting a secular analog of predestination would compromise the cosmopolitan and universal aims of contemporary liberal political theory. And talk of secular sanctification would necessarily involve leaving the domain of the right to engage questions of the good. Now, I haven't written this here, but to be sure, many a liberal have attempted to create space for the liberal virtues. And so if, if y'all want to spend a few minutes talking about that in a moment, I'd be happy to explore whether I think that's a fruitful enterprise. Uh, indeed, the early modern world is no longer our own. Liberal theory can no longer countenance the possibility of sin, only crime. And it lacks the frameworks for conceiving man as having a soul that needs nurturing. So despite liberal theory's predictions to the contrary, we see all around us manifestations of law that go beyond world-maintaining functions. I've mentioned this already, but um, our references to mercy in ancient Israel and how mercy implicates a category of exception that somehow both abrogates the norm um, without violating the norm. In our own legal system, as I said, we do find judges who issue pardons, juries that nullify verdicts, legislatures that grant amnesty, and so forth. These legal practices, I think, pose significant challenges, at least questions, not challenges, to liberal theory. So now I, I'm explicitly confessing the influence of a former professor of mine, um, uh, Paul Kahn, on my thinking, where Lilla sees a great separation okay, between pre-liberal and liberal political community. Kahn sees continuity. According to Kahn, and I'm quoting here, failure to recognize the quasi-religious character of the modern nation state as the context within which liberalism operates is the single largest failure of liberal political theorists. Where does he uh, articulate that view? This is in, polit this is in political theology. Okay. Or no, this is in putting liberalism in its place, page 93. Okay. Um, have you read Putting Liberalism? I haven't. That's, uh, that's a nice phrase. Yeah. Um, reading them, liberal political theorists, um, one would never know that the modern nation state has been the site of endless passion and of sacrifice for ultimate meanings. For them, the people appear only as a decision-making device, majority rule, in a world stripped of ultimate meanings. To the liberal theorists, the passion of politics appears always as a dangerous outbreak of archaic forms of belief and practice. End quote. In other words, or maybe following from this, we cannot make sense of values like patriotism or practices like sacrifice except through something like what Cover termed a nomos, a normative universe. If law is simply a tool for maintaining social control, it will not arouse feelings of patriotism. If law does not implicate questions of meaning, it will not inspire sacrifice. Law's latent supports are doing work for the liberal state, whether or not liberal theory still leaves a place for such work. Okay, so as I wrap up, and I really am almost done, because um, I'd like to have a few minutes for discussion. As I wrap up, I have two brief concluding thoughts. First, regarding international law. If Lilla is right that law is done best when it avoids questions of meaning, that it's done best when it focuses simply on maintaining order, then international law is not particularly disadvantaged. It does not need and it will not necessarily benefit from what I've called law's latent supports. Things like a shared narrative or a shared vision of the future. If, however, cover and con are correct, international law faces more serious challenges. If law necessarily implicates questions of meaning, narrative, and identity, international law has much less to draw from. In particular, it lacks the sort of latent supports that are at work beneath the surface in actual liberal states. 
And my concluding thought is not specific to international law and is perhaps too banal of an observation even to make, but it is this. The liberal state must constantly balance and make decisions between competing goods such as order and meaning. Liberal theory has the luxury of avoiding the difficult decisions that the actual practice of law and politics requires. I don't necessarily suggest that liberal theory or practice abandon the principles that have allowed liberalism to flourish and that have brought about so many virtues and values that we cherish. I simply suggest that liberal theory be more sensitive to the realities and challenges of liberal practice. I'm done. <laughs> So how, how do you uh, see then these uh, competing latent supports informing the law? So th this is, I don't remember actually this, the last part of Cover's argument, but um, so you think of what's happening with Dworkin, right, the hedgehog book. Yep. So the question is whether pluralism can survive within the law. Yep or whether we, the law has to kind of adopt one main idea. Yeah. Um, I tend to think it's the former, that I think the law has a lot of essentially contested ideas mm -hmm. and that we continue to debate about those. Yeah. So there's competing narratives, right. both, I guess, latently supporting, but sometimes explicitly recognized yeah. in the law. Um, so how would you think about <coughs> How do you, so so Kelvin has a cleaner picture yep. because mm -hmm. he's you know he's proposing a certain Christian yep. understanding that everyone should share, mm -hmm. and now we're in a position where we know we're from a political standpoint yep. that's yep. that idea is gone, mm -hmm. but we also find the liberal picture inadequate because yeah, right. we know these questions of meaning are essential. Yep. So so how do how do you I think that's a great question. In so many ways, that that type of concern is what um, animates so much of what I do and think about to the extent I still get to be, <laughs> this kind of thing. Um, the fact is, the there has been something of a separation, whether or not it's as great as Lilla claims. I mean, yeah. things are... The world has been desacralized in a way. I'm thinking about the beginning of Charles Taylor's uh, Secular Age. That I think does a really good job of outlining that. If y'all haven't read that, I commend it to you. Where yeah, I've read, I've read that part of it. Yeah, I, I mean, wasn't I, able to stay I didn't there. finish the whole thing. It's, it's an absolute piece of the book. But um, I, I just kept it kept bothering me that I never defined religion. But that was yeah, that, that was that's a somewhat of the side sure. to argument. Um, but but for Taylor. It's more about the type of secularism that he writes about in the secular age is the, the secularism that comes about from there being a kind of new default options, right? There's almost kind of a new norm that we don't necessarily connect what we see right in front of us with something that is transcendent. Um, people still do it, but it's conceivable that many people don't, and in fact, many people don't. But anyway, so the, we are in a different time. We are in a different place. We are in a more plural space in many respects, although I recognize there's probably been a great deal of pluralism at many points in time and that some of these mm -hmm. authors from earlier points in time didn't acknowledge that or do justice to them. To answer your question though, I think that there has to be a way of, um, of imbuing certain values and norms with, um, with meaning, even if as you said, there's still space for kind of debating the contours of that. I'm thinking about our Constitution, for example. We recently celebrated Constitution Day about six weeks ago or so. I think Constitution Don't, don't all universities have yes, to have, have some to, kind of right, or we don't get, get your federal, money, money, right? federal um, money. And so for me, I think that in this same piece, I don't mean to dwell on cover so much, but it's the context in which we're discussing, so let's stick with cover for a moment. In addition to distinguishing law as world creating versus law as world maintaining, he also draws a distinction between different types of education, as you might recall, mm -hmm. between imperial education and what he calls pietic education. Imperial education involves being educated about things. Okay? Pietic education is about being educated into a system, mm -hmm. right? And I think that liberal liberal theory often comes with with certain bundles of things and law as social control is often related to education in an imperial sort of way mm. um, 
And I think what Cover suggests is that education and law are not as simple as maybe the traditional liberal narrative would suggest. That education rightfully involves being educated into particular systems as well as being educated about the different realities that are out there. And that doesn't mean that being educated about things is bad. I work at the liberal arts college where one of the chief things that we try to accomplish is exposing students to a broad range of things, learning about a lot of different things. But to go back to your question, Mark, I think that the Constitution, ideally, our constitutional tradition involves being educated into a system in a way mm. where we value things like free speech. Right as I, I was late getting over here because we had about 100 abortion protesters show up at Millsaps all of a sudden. Really? You know, and this is something that Why? is, well, they're just making rounds. I don't know. Um, and they, they were making their stop at Millsaps. And, uh, it's peculiar because the the Bible really says nothing about abortion, well, okay. so it's like taken as a central Christian tenet. We didn't get into the theological disputes. We were just right. trying. They had a bullhorn right in front, right in front of the classrooms, and so. We, so it wasn't really. Uh, a the, there wasn't any real dialogue. I don't know. I was in a hurry to get here, so I didn't talk to him. Our campus security guys seem to have everything under control, but you know these these things that happen in our daily lives implicate questions of freedom. Um, what, what do we mean by freedom? Does freedom include someone's ability to stand outside of a classroom and with a bullhorn screaming things about abortion? Um, maybe, maybe not. But it, it's something that we, on some level, we're united by, or I'd like to think that we're united in many ways by a common vision. Um, liberty and justice for all. Or, or these kinds of things that might sound very thin. Um, but they leave space for us to, to hash it out in a way. So maybe the answer is that we're going to have some sort of vision that we buy into or share, but it's just going to look different. It's not going to be as comprehensive. And this is the thing I'm struggling with, you know, because Taylor uses the social imaginary, right, idea, yeah. which I kind of like yeah. that term yeah. because in a democracy, we're really buying into an idea. Yes. Right? Exactly. That we're all sharing in some respect. Mm -hmm. The thing that I'm not quite sure about is, um, you know, we all see on issues, there's always a range of views on how much speech we should sure. have, how much free speech, and whether that, and, you know, as feminists say, kind of then leads to inequality if it's used right. inappropriately, so there might be a tension. Um, but what I'm not sure about is how much disagreement we can have and still say that we share something yeah. as, as a social mm -hmm. imaginary. A lot of people share a social imaginary which is pluralistic. Yep. Others think pluralism is the problem yep. that needs to be eradicated. Yep. So um, yeah. it, I, I think what our country is a test in how far pluralism can go. In a sense. I think that's right in a lot of ways. I think that these dilemmas are I mean, pluralism necessary and, and intractable. Yes. I mean, I think that um, you know, one, so I'll go ahead and plug an event um, that's happening at Millsaps in a few weeks. Uh, Stanley Howard's Just Stout and Kathleen Cabin are going to be coming oh, that should on be December a, 2nd. I know Kathleen. Um, yeah. It should be a great event. But um, Jeffrey Stout's Democracy and Tradition. It's a great book, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great book that tries to answer that question in certain ways. Yeah. Right? We are a pluralist place, right? We are, our democracy consists of lots of different traditions in a way. Yeah. Um, but that is not, at least according to Stout, grounds for saying that any one of these traditions should um, trump the others right. or win right. out. Right. But it also doesn't necessarily point towards a Rawlsian resolution where we just try to come across or come up with some sort of thin lowest common denominator. But that it's, um, and in many respects, this gets into the sort of tensions between. Um, you know, think Kant and Hegel, right? Yeah. Uh, think social contract models of political community versus more dialectical models of political community and conceptions of law. Um, I think your question, at least on some level, at least on some level, um, has a sort of uh, a Kantian um, uh, note to it that, that, that we need to get to a place where we have some sort of agreement. Yeah, um, actually, that's not what I intended yeah. um, because I'm trying to resist that yeah. because yeah. I think that's just as much. I mean, you see it with political liberalism like you do with Calvinism. There, yeah. there seems to be 
a sense that politics has to be mm -hmm. shaped by agreement on certain fundamental yep. beliefs. Yep. And I'm not, yep. quite, I'm not quite. I think it's thinner than yep. than both of the, those traditions mm -hmm. suggest. Yep. I think, and that's why I think it's a test. Yep. And that solidarity comes from other means, mm -hmm. maybe than than agreement about those fundamental things. But uh, yeah, I mean, you think of Rorty, where he he seemed optimistic that there could be solidarity. Um, amidst the uncertainty that in some ways it was the, the contingency itself, the recognition mm. that there wasn't certain meaning, there yeah. wasn't certainty that would bring about a certain democratic solidarity. That's one approach. I I don't know. That, that's, that's a little cynical. A little, it's a yeah. little cynical. Yeah. 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 Where's, where's the role of, I, I'm looking forward to having a conversation on yeah. a larger level right. about a lot of these that's ideas because it. it's invoking a lot of Different traditions, radical democracy. Yeah, I'm all over the place at times. No, not, not at all. That was not what I meant by yeah. that. I have one question for you. In your talk, mm -hmm. it's a, um, it's a, it's an intellectual history. Yes. Uh, with a particular vision, of, but it's an intellectual history. What is, like, it's gonna sound like a big question, but it's it's really not. Mm -hmm. In your idea, when you think about this intellectual history. Do these ideas, I mean, obviously it's a give and take. The ideas give rise to institutional arrangements yep. and yep. new configurations, and then those configurations give rise to new ideas, right? right? Anticipated. Yep. Yep. Okay. But what is the actual dynamic or ana analytical framework by which you could analyze mm -hmm. that relationship or how that operates yep. according to those ideas or those institutional frameworks? Like, how would you go yep. about doing that, explaining how those ideas developed? That's a very good question. This is yeah. kind of a Marxian question. Right? Yeah. I don't think it's a Marxian <laughs> question. I think it's a, a I mean, very How ideas shape reality, or how does reality shape ideas? I think it's, it's the basis of all sociological and anthropological disciplines. So, like, if you look at sociology, mm -hmm. sociology would say the intellectual histories have their own merit and we have to study them, mm -hmm. but we shouldn't pretend that they're not embedded in contextual, sure. cultural, sure. historical, and I think that's a key point in liberalism in the yeah. modern era. So to ask the question of how do ideas develop yeah. and influence and get influenced, I do think you're right that structural Marxism can address it. I mean, that's I, I read on that too. But I do think that's just a general common sociological concern yeah. that came out of something in the 19th well, century. Well, and covers, in fact, cover cites Berger, mm -hmm. sociology. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where he's getting this world maintaining idea, mm -hmm. world, yeah. um, world. Uh, cre I don't think I don't think Berger uses the world create uh, creating ideas, mm -hmm. but um, so yeah, certainly sociology understands there's a give and a take. But when you the causal aspect of it. The is, whole movie, I, I, was, I thought you were suggesting more of a causal aspect. Not that it's so thing, something so simple. I don't even know a scholar who argues a determinism of one or the other. Yeah. I hear critiques of people. Say, right. Right. They say right. those people do, but I've never actually seen it. Yeah. So I, but I mean, the whole move in history over the last thirty years. I mean, Cambridge. Oh, that has also been about moving from just simple intellectual histories to embedded history. Yes, and, right. That's exactly right. So I, I think that's a very good question. And I think it's something that, to be honest, I, I need to probably give more thought and be more reflective about. I think that I'm very, uh, my natural inclinations are um, those of an intellectual historian in a way. That's what I find interesting and I think my bent in, in certain respects. Um, but I think one of the things that you do sometimes find with intellectual historians is a telling of a story that is somewhat unclear about. Um, what led to what, right? You, you point to something at one point in time, you point to something else at another point in time. I, I'm thinking of Berlin. I enjoy reading Berlin mm -hmm. a great deal. Um, but it's Berlin is often a, a little bit slippery. He's yeah. often a little bit slippery. Okay, so you pointed to this thing in the counter-enlightenment, and now you pointed to this 100, 200 years later, um, and you write really beautifully, and they're connected. Oh, but wait a minute, how are they exactly? And I, I don't know, I mean, I, so that's my non-answer. How answer would the embedded way. narrative be different? I guess maybe it's a question mm -hmm. I would respond. That's a good question. Yeah. So I, I think, so I've got, so on Friday when we give our talk, I'm gonna I'm gonna give my pitch okay. on, on this, and it'll be on video. I okay. just got to- He's teasing you here. 
<laughs> no, the only I want to respond, but I got uh, sure, I understand. my review today. Yeah, yeah. My, yeah, you should go because. Uh, and I want to give a real so answer. He's to got that. you know we sure, classes. Exactly. And, yeah. Yeah. Let me write and say thank you very yes. much. So we have this package. Kenny, thanks. Thanks, thanks so much. Nice. It was fun. Let's keep the conversation going. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, and on Friday we'll have a debate, right? I can't yeah. wait actually. Is this open? Well, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. we'd be. Well, I'll like, I'll give you the okay. details. I don't know. We have such a. Sh we have three of us with about the same amount of time, yeah. so it's very sure. truncated. What's the title? Uh, I don't know. I, what did you call the challenges of pluralism?